Um, welcome back. This is some um, OS. No, they're not OCR. Yeah, they're Wedgec, or they're rather they're Educas. Uh, this is like the Welsh board that a lot of people do in England now as well. And these are some questions for paper one, which is tomorrow. So if you've been watching, then you'll know I'm going through some questions and you can see my uh, previous live feeds as well later on once you've done with this one. I went through some OCR ones and I've gone through some Edexcel ones and I, um, and I need uh, sorry, uh, some OCR ones and some, ed some Edexcel ones and these are some Educast ones. And then I'm going to go through a few things and I've added Half-Life to my list and I hope that helps you guys out. I'm going to go through models of the atom and how ed evidence changes theory. I'm going to go through... Boyle's Law stuff, pressure and volume, um, momentum collisions, uh, which we've been through quite a few times in these questions, actually, circuit problems and how you can solve them, and half-life as well. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to power through these ones, okay? It should be quite a short little feed this time. I hope it's really useful. I'll stop and answer questions at the end. I've just had somebody explain this diggles to me, which is nice. So yeah, um, exaggeration of people get annoyed by application. So yeah, the, the, we've got to really think to yourself, well, it's, the question is not about Mr. Tickles and his biscuit tin. I like that, I like that. Okay, the question is about something that you do know, and this is a good example straight away, because I read this and I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm pretty sure this is about static electricity and the stuff that I need to know to um, make sure that I can put it, I can get these marks in static electricity is, well, all right, there's friction and that causes electrons to be transferred. So before I even thought about that, you know that you've noted that it's explained and static electricity. So the standard explanation of static electricity is this friction between things, electrons are transferred. Now there's some detail in there for the last mark that you need to kind of tease out. Um, this is about these clouds and basically these ice sheets that go down and then moisture rises. Okay, so it's, um, as it falls down, the base of the thunder clouds become negatively charged and the top becomes positive. So you have to actually say the ice becomes negative uh, and because it gained electrons and the moisture becomes positive. And you can see that in this kind of diagram here. This is our kind of, there's a difference not between the two clouds, but the top and bottom of the clouds. So the top of the clouds become positive and the bottom becomes negative. So we're used to this kind of explanation of uh, lightning storms. But then they're asking us to talk about this, how, how this um, lightning conductor here thing works, this thick copper strip. And they, they explain a little bit of it. The negatively charged base of the thundercloud causes a movement of charge in the lightning conductor. Positive and negative ions are produced in the air around the sharp points. The movement of these um, reduces the buildup of charge on the cloud, making lightning uh, less likely. Describe how positive charge is produced at the points of the lightning conductor. So these are the points here. How do these things become positive? Well, because the electrons in the conductor are repelled. Um, and where are they going? They're going to Earth through the lightning conductor. So there's my two points. Again, that's something that we do know. Here's a whole thing about a lightning conductor. Here's Mr. Tickle's biscuit tins. But actually, this is the stuff that you've been taught about static electricity. Just apply it to that. So these are quite you know, weird questions, I think, but we just apply what we know. So um, explain how the ions produced in the air around the points help prevent the build of a charge. Again, oh no, what on earth are you talking about ions produced in the air? Ah, this is this bit here. So you go back to the thing, these ions, ah, right, okay. They're preventing the build of a charge in the cloud. Positive and negative ions are produced in the air around the sharp points. These are the sharp points here. So basically you get positives and negatives all the way around here. Okay, well, what that, that means is that current can kind of flow in this little section here. So it allows this charge to dissipate. It allows the charge to discharge, basically. So there's attraction between the ions and the bottom of the cloud. Okay, so this discharges the cloud. And this is what we're really looking for, this idea of discharging here. Okay, give two reasons why the lightning conductor shown in the diagram minimizes the damage to the building. Okay, so two reasons why it minimizes the damage to the building. So what, what, what did it do? You've been told, it, we've figured out it discharges the cloud. So it reduces the overall charge in the cloud, therefore it's going to be lower current, yeah. And also charge flows to earth through the conductor rather than through the building. So that's what a lightning conductor does on the side of tall buildings. Okay, the lightning strike, a current of 3000 amps flows through the lightning conductor for 0 0.005 seconds. Calculate the amount of charge transferred and state its unit. So you've gone ahead and recalled the equation, mark. You've checked the units are coherent, amps and seconds, and you plug them in, mark. 15 for the, um, the charge mark and the unit, coulombs, 
and I almost made the mistake of writing amps because I didn't think about it. And remember, like, right, okay, you can probably get two marks without doing any kind of thinking on this. You, you just recalled your equation and you recalled the charge is, me is measured in coulombs. Next bit. Okay, the graph uh, shows the motion of the train um, during part of its journey. Okay, so here's another, this is the same kind of skill. Again, different exam board, same kind of skill. Let's just check what type of graph we're working with here. It's a velocity time graph. So we can apply those kind of points. Gradient is acceleration, area under is a distance. Horizontal is no um, change in speed, no acceleration. So how does the appearance of lines A to B and C to D show the acceleration is greater for A to B? Well, line A to B has a steeper gradient than C to D. So on a velocity, you don't have to write this, you just have to make the point it's a steeper gradient, but I want to talk about it. On a velocity time graph, the um, gradient is the acceleration. The student concludes the train must travel further between C and D than B, C as the velocity is higher. Use the graph to decide whether or not this, this conclusion is correct. So you need to calculate some areas underneath the graph because area underneath a velocity time graph is the distance. So you need the, the area between B and C and the area between C and D. So I've just sectioned them off and this is a rectangle. So just 200 is the X, 15 is the Y, so 3000. And this is a trapezium, so I've used a trapezium um, area rule there. Half times B plus A times the height, in other words, the average of the two lengths, times by the height, and this is the height in this case. Or you could just turn it into a triangle and a rectangle if you're more comfortable with that. But anyway, the area comes to 5,000. It's absolutely fine. But you need, now, and they've given you an indicator of this, um, you only get two marks for each of the areas, in other words, but you need to make a little statement that C to D is bigger, so therefore the student is correct. In this exam board, they've given a little lines for that, but um, there's loads of this type of question now, okay, in physics where you actually have to use the graph, fair enough, decide whether or not the conclusion is correct, and it implies the last mark is for making a little statement to say, yeah, yeah, that's, I've understood that conclusion, and it is correct by my, my calculations. Next bit. Um, calculate the acceleration of the train from C to D. So then you have to use the gradient from C to D. Okay, um, don't, don't use the absolute values, don't read off the absolute values, you use the change in. So the change in is 10. Here the change in velocity is 10 and the time is 250. So you just read off delta V and T from the graph and you get 10 over 250 and that's the mark. So reading off the things accurately, uh, using the equation that you know, and 0.04 is the final mark there. What conclusions can be made about the size of resultant forces that uh, in the readings A to B, C, B, C, and C to D? Right, you don't need calculations. They've said that, that's nice of them. Okay, but there's actually four marks for this. Gosh, where are all those four marks going to be? Well, they've told you um, it's about resultant force. So the first thing you're going to think about, I hope, is you're going to think about, well, this is actually Newton's second law the resultant force is equal to ma. Okay, so you've been talking about accelerations and you said one area of the acceleration is greater, one area of the acceleration is less. So um, my first point is that the resultant force is proportional to acceleration. Okay, get a mark for that. So therefore, the greatest resultant force between A and B, because it's the greatest acceleration or because the line is steepest, so the resultant force from B to C, there is zero acceleration, and B to C was that kind of flat part. Okay? So um, that's just really qualitatively reading off the graph. Did you recognise, if you read that, do you recognise that that's actually a Newton's second law question? Okay, driver estimates the stopping distance for his train to be approximately 800 metres. Train is travelling at this, that is U. Uh, decelerates to rest, that is V, zero, 0.4 metres per second squared. Choose an equation from page two. So in um, Educast, they have all of the SUVAT equations. Okay, and this is the one that you need to use in this case. Now, how did you decide which equation you need to use? Well, what you do is you write down what you know. You know the final speed is zero, the initial speed is 25, you know the acceleration, and you want to know the distance x or s if, you, if you're used to using SUVAT rather than x, you at that, or whatever that would be, you know, like, or I don't know what you'd call that. It's annoying, isn't it? Um, anyway. I'll shut up because I'm probably going to lose you if I chat to myself like that, just babbling on. So you basically identify what you know and then you select the equation. And that's a really important habit in physics. What do you know? Select equation. So now you put the numbers in, simplify. So now I've straight away moved this over here uh, by taking it away. So minus 25 squared. And remember, it's not minus 25 squared, it's minus 25 squared. 
So that becomes minus um, 625. And this 2 times 0 0.4 is 0 0.8. So now we arrange 625 over 0.8 gives you minus 781, blah, 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 blah. And it's a distance, so eventually it doesn't matter. But you basically, the final marks are for stopping distance is this, and yeah, it's approximately 800. So again, they've indicated with a little bit of write, a little bit of a uh, few lines for writing, you need to give a statement, okay? So choose an equation, use it, explain, okay? So this is me using it, the final marks are for actually explaining using what I've done here, okay? Carrying on. This one cracks on about the trains, uh, something chronic. And there's two graphs on here, and you know you have to really pause and get your head around it. Okay, but actually the question is pretty straightforward afterwards. So I, sometimes you know if you've got a lot of detail, what you're looking for, let's read the question first. Use the information above to explain where from A, B, C, D, or E you'd expect the train to have the shortest stopping distance. Right. Okay. So um, essentially, then let's try and understand the different sections. This shows you how the track height changes with the distance. So this is like a, a section through the hill, basically. So in other words, increasing height and lower height, so uphill and downhill, all right? Let's have a look at this. This shows you the stopping distance for the kind of percentage gradients, whether the train is descending or ascending. And that makes sense to us because if we're going downhill, then some of our component of our weight is down the hill as well. So um, it's going to be harder for us to stop. If we're traveling up the hill, then a component of our weight is down the hill. So we're going to stop in a shorter distance. That makes sense to us, right? Okay, let's have a little look through here then. Which section is going to have the shortest stopping distance? Is it basically descending or ascending? Is it the maximum or is it on the horizontal? Okay, well, therefore, it's going to be section B would have the shortest stopping distance okay, because that's uphill. As the first graph shows, the shortest stopping distance is at the steepest ascending gradient and B is the steepest ascending gradient just there. Okay, I will just have a little pause and have a little look through some of the comments just, just now because why not? Um, and then afterwards I'm going to get on with uh, get on with the bits that I'm going to go through. So merely, what are you on about, Laura, there? I'm not sure what you're talking about merely just there. Have I, have I said merely? Did they say merely in there? How different are each of the exam board's topics? Not very, not very different at all because the government have insisted that all the physics specs uh, have the same kind of content. I don't know why the government think that, but they do. Um, I think they're an improvement on the last set, but they're all very similar, which I think is very, very difficult. So yeah, you're right, Ultra. They are very similar, but they're in different orders. So um, I've tried to pick ones that are in most you know, that like the electricity, the magnetism is coming up for most people tomorrow, as is the mechanics stuff. Do you have a video going through the precision, repeatability, reproducibility, validity, <laughs> right? If not, can you run over it real quick? Thanks. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so um, I'll have to look back at the live thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll prep that up. That's fine. I can do that. Yeah, um, that makes sense for that. Yeah, um, that's brilliant. Yeah, um, thanks for looking for that, Ultra. I do have some things about the different kind of keywords. Yeah, do you know, I do actually, yeah. I have a video which is called um, How to Write Evaluations, okay? Where I go through all that stuff. Yeah, let's go for, go for that, okay? Um, rather than me run through it again, because it's quite tedious stuff. But yeah, you need to get your head around it. The, I think the difference between repeatability and reproducibility is one that people are struggling. People normally get the same results every single time, time they do. Reproducibility is about the... Um, the findings being the same. And they're both examples of reliability. So the exam boards have stopped really using rely reliability and they go for this repeatability and reproducibility to distinguish between them. Okay, um, this is A-Level Physics Online. That's nice to see you, Lewis. Um, Lewis runs A-Level Physics Online and next year is gonna do GCC Physics Online as well, which we're really looking forward to because these videos are excellent. And if you guys are looking forward to doing A-Level Physics next year, then you need to check out, and you might as well just go ahead and sub up to A Level Physics Online as well. Just now, maybe even if it's you know if you're aiming for the grade eights and nines, check out some of the mechanics stuff. Check out some of the electricity stuff on A Level Physics Online because there's excellent, excellent resources there, as well. Um, Seb, Seb, and Dan. Right. Okay. Um, good to see everybody. Um, thank you very much for. Uh, Jumping in, what's a definitive modal auxiliary verb? 
is that going to be some, is that an English thing? Okay, yeah, I'm not going to help you out with your English things um, because I'll get it all wrong. I hope your English exams went well today, guys. Okay, I know it's been a stressful day. It's been a stressful week, but you can look forward to the end of this week. You can chill because you're going to have a half term. Okay, just remember Mr. Tickle's biscuits in. Like it. Um, glad you all turned up. Okay, I'm, so this one is about a motor. It's a DC motor you can see straight away. I'm going to do this one and then one on vectors and scalars, and then I'm going to pause briefly, and then I'll go through just a few things, um, a few things for, uh, that, that are you going to be useful for you tomorrow that you've asked for. Okay, so here we go. A student investigates the behavior of a simple electric motor. The student makes the following changes to the circuit, predict the effect of the rotation on the coil. So nice and easy. Well, does it, how does adjusting the variable resistor to a lower resistance? Well, a lower resistance is a lower is a sorry, higher current is going to be, so that is going to cause a bigger magnetic field, so therefore it's going to increase the speed. Doubling the number of turns on the wire is going to increase the speed. Okay, nice and easy. Reversing the magnetic field is going to reverse the direction of the rotation. Okay, so that is that. Now motors um, work by having a, a circuit connected across a coil. Now every time that coil spins half the way around, you can see this commutator, the split ring commutator, this is a DC motor, has a split ring commutator. Um, every time that split ring, it's written right there, look. Um, every time that split ring spins, then the different side of the coil connects to the other side of the circuit, okay? Meaning the current is always this direction on this side and always this direction on this side but A to B changes as does C to D. All right, moving on. In the diagram above the side, the force on side A to B is nine times 10 to the minus two, okay? Um, the coil consists of 40 turns of wire. The current through the coil is 1.5 amps and the magnetic field strength is 30 mi uh, milli teslas. So my first thing is I don't want milli, so let's get rid of that. Divide by a thousand gives me uh, 0.03. Now rearrange to length, because we're asked to use an equation from page two, so we go ahead and select this equation from our formula sheet. Calculate the length of side AB in the magnetic field. All right, so we want the side A and B. We're told that it's gonna be 40 times round, but let's leave that bit of data here, because that's not a, a um, value in this equation. Rearrange for length, probably get a mark for that, okay? And plug in all the numbers that we know. Not uh, force, um, field, and current. And that gives us two meters. Now that's two meters of wire in the field. But we've been told that that wire is looped around 40 times. All right, so th this distance um, is uh, two meters over 40. Okay, um, it's two meters of wire in this direction as well. So the last thing I need to do is two over 40 to give me the actual length being 0.05. Okay, they, they tell you what equation to use, but often, especially if it's worth four marks, you're going to need to do something with it before you use it. It might be a conversion, it might be a rearrangement. So power is I squared R. So power is current squared times resistance. So let's rearrange. We're asked to calculate the current. So let's rearrange for current. So first thing we do is move R across. So I squared is P over R. And then I equals the root of P over R. So Put in the numbers that we know, check that watts and ohms are the standard SI units. Yes, they are. So watts is the power, ohms is the resistance, and boom. So you get marks for rearranging, marks for subbing the numbers in, and mark for the final answer. Okay, this one here, vectors and scalars. Velocity is a vector quantity and speed is a scalar quantity. Explain the difference between scalar and vector quantities. Vectors have size and direction, scalars only have size. Okay, so something that indicates you know vectors are different because they've got direction as well as size. All right, the London Eye rotates at a constant speed of 0.24 meters per second. Explain what happens to the velocity as the cars on the ride as it rotates. Well, velocity is constantly changing, Mark, as direction is constantly changing. So you, this is identify something you know about vectors and scalars, and this is apply. So this is just identify, and this is apply. So Mr. Tickle's biscuit tin here needs you to apply what you've already know that the question's all about. Okay. Um, one rotation on the London Eye takes about 30 minutes. Calculate the approximate circumference of 
the London Eye. Now, a lot of people are going to think, what, do I need to do pi d or something? I don't have a distance, I don't have a, uh, a diameter or something like that. So no, we don't need to do that. We need to remember, okay, it goes around once every 30 meters. So the circumference is the distance traveled at the speed of 0.24. So really, this is just good old speed, distance and time. Rearrange for distance is speed times time. Number, that's the speed there. Well, that's meters per second. So we've got time in minutes. So let's convert by doing 30 times 60 to give us 1800. The circumference is 432 meters. So mark for rearranging, mark for identifying and converting and putting the numbers in and a mark for your final answer. And again, here we go. Momentum question once more. Okay, this is something I'm going to go through afterwards okay in the next brief live feed so momentum is another vector quantity now this is really important and i made that point to myself here this is a different direction so actually let's treat this not as two meters per second but minus two okay now that is a, a really important thing that will come later on so when objects collide with each other momentum is conserved that means momentum before is equal to momentum afterwards and this is why i suggest you remember okay for momentum when objects collide with each other, momentum is conserved. Two ice skaters, A and B, each of mass 50 kilograms collide as shown. So you, you're not written on here, but you know that this one is 60 kgs, as is this one, 60 kgs, right? What basically is calculate the velocity of skater A after the collision? So that's the only thing we don't know there. So we write out our equation, okay, and then we fill it with the stuff that we do know. So M1, U1 is the mass of this one, 60. Sorry, I've written 50, 60 and then done 50. Okay, so 50 kilograms. So you get the same answer if you did 60, actually, because they're both the same mass, but it's important you get it right. Okay, so the mass of the first one, 50 kilograms. The velocity of the first one, 6. Initial velocity is U. Mass of the second one, 50. Initial velocity of the second one, minus 2. And actually, I almost made that mistake. I had to kind of check myself before I wrecked myself on that one. So then we know that is equal to the final momentum of the first one plus the final momentum of the second one. So mass is 50 still, hasn't changed mass. But we don't know V, we want to know V, so write in as a bit of algebra. We know M2 is 50 still, and we know the speed, or the velocity of the um, second one after it. So now, put in all the numbers, we just simplify. So I'll just bang that all in the calculator, you get 200. You obviously just make that 50V. 50 times 2 is 100. Now rearrange, take 100 from both sides, gives us 50V equals 100. And then V, therefore, equals 2 because V is 100 over 50. So the velocity is 2 meters per second. Now, in the mark scheme, it says 2 to the right. So you might want to put a little, you know, brackets to the right. But I think it's going to be obvious to the examiner here that I'm treating this direction as being the negative direction, as it would be on a graph. So that's what I would just do there, okay? So basically, mark for actually applying the law of conservation of momentum, mark for calculating momentum before and making it equal to momentum afterwards, and finally for summing it around to get to two, okay? A squash ball of mass 25 grams and a tennis ball of mass 50 both have the same momentum. What conclusion can you make about their velocities? Well, they both have the same momentum. It means the M of the squash ball times the velocity of the squash ball is equal to the M of the tennis ball times the velocity of the tennis ball. And the mass of the tennis ball is twice the mass of the squash ball. So the velocity of the tennis ball must be half than the velocity of the squash ball. So actually, you would have got one out of two of these marks if you would have just said the squash ball must be faster. But because you've been given numerical data, you're going to get that factor in there, and you're going to say half or double or whatever in the right direction to make sure that makes sense. All right, really quick look through the comments then, and then I'm going to go away just for us and make sure that everything's ready for the last little live feed where I'll go through and I'll answer any questions you guys have, um, unless I won't have time to do it. Um, how further maths, yeah, you're all looking forward to further maths, I'm sure. Further maths, yeah, is awesome, especially if you're going to go on to do um, your physics next year. You're going to, that's going to be really useful too if you do further maths. Great to see you all here. Okay, um, will we ever have to calculate for a collision where the masses don't stick after an impact? Yeah, this is one where they don't stick here, Laura, yeah? So, um, yes, you will. So, identify, I'm going to basically give you three uh, equations that you can remember 
and you'll know exactly which one to use and how to recognize that. Remember the scene from the B movie where the B gets stuck on the tennis ball, Laura? Yes. I don't remember that. I don't have seen that one. I haven't seen that one, so maybe I need to. Is Newton an alchemist? What you mean? Does he make? Can he make gold? No. Okay. Um, another um, fun bets master story. Then why not? Well, it's not really a story. I've always wanted to do an alchemy lesson with with kids, and I really I just want to have a chemistry lesson on the first of April where I can do an alchemy lesson and just pretend that we made gold, um, and then say, "Ha ha! April Fools! You can't turn one atom into another." Hmm. Can you turn one atom? Into